we have put together a very excellent panel. So all of them very knowledgeable in the fintech scene and with deep insights and when it comes to trends and what will shape the future of the industry. So let's jump right at it and welcome on stage uh, Anna Storåkers and online Christopher Malmer, Daniel Chilean and Susanne Hannestad. So welcome to all of you and uh, let's do it the way that we've done it uh, earlier this day uh, with the presentations of you. If you were to pitch yourself and what you do to an audience, how would that sound like? Uh, let's start with uh, Anna. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I, um, I like to work from different perspectives. Uh, so I have a, a mixed background in finance where I've been both an executive with the responsibility for both retail banking and SME banking, uh, also head of strategy for a while for Nordea. Uh, and um, prior to that, I worked as an investment banker. So I have a few different uh, operational perspectives, but then I, I try to use that now by um, working as both a board member for uh, a large bank, ABN AMRO in the Netherlands, uh, but also some challenger, a challenger bank in Sweden that is private equity owned, which is Nordax Bank. Right. Uh, I work for also a, a company called Max Batisen, which is private equity owned. And then I also do fintechs, both as a chairman of one fintech company, but, but also as a seed investor and angel investor. So I try to spend time in different roles and in different contexts so uh, a lot and of, hope that will <laughs> A lot of stuff going on. Yeah. 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 Okay. A, mix, a mixed bag. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Susanne, what about you? Yeah, I'm based in Oslo. We're working with uh, fintechs uh, throughout uh, the world, uh, uh, predominantly uh, with the Nordics and, and the Baltics, uh, with all the ecosystems uh, that are there. So it's predominantly uh, on the scaling uh, side to get uh, the uh, fintechs uh, out, uh, out of the Nordic, out of Europe and uh, into the global uh, world. I have uh, 10 years in uh, Nordea building up the card business across uh, the Nordic and the Baltic. And then I'm working together with uh, Findexable uh, with the Global Fintech uh, Index. And then I'm also in, in a few boards, uh, international and uh, local and uh, regional. All right, thank you. So Daniel, uh, wh what about you? What do you do during the days? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> I wonder uh, myself sometimes. So I, I'm one of two founders and, and CEO of a um, company called Tink. Uh, it's a European open banking platform. Uh, we like to think ourselves as the rails and the brains of open banking, meaning that we build connectivity to some three and a half thousand banks across 14 markets, uh, where we do account aggregation and payment initiation. And on top of that, we build products that helps our customers get the most out of this underlying infrastructure, ranging from um, uh, transaction um, categorization onto uh, more advanced finance management tools, credit scoring, uh, and, and payments uh, products. And so it's, it's a platform as a service um, that we enable to, to our customers who are um, financial institutions, ranging from the, the kind of the mega banks of Europe, the BBVAs or the BNP Paribas, onto the national champions, the, the SCBs, the, the Nordeas, uh, but also the, the, the fintechs, um, the, the unicorns, the Klarna's, the PayPal's, the Adians. Uh, as well as, as um, uh, hundreds and actually thousands of, of smaller developers and, and fintechs as well. All right, all right, thank you. And Christopher, last but not least, who are you? Thank you. Um, thanks, for, thanks for having us. Great to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm responsible for uh, an uh, initiative called SEBX um, at SEB. Um, and I think SEBX is probably best described as a fintech uh, within uh, a bank uh, and uh, you know so so why are we doing this well you know this is uh, in, in an industry that is just rapidly transforming and I think everyone on this on this call and I'm sure this conference is all kind of pointed to the rapid change in so many parts of our industry uh, ongoing and only accelerating of course being a large established institution you know there is a large um, you know platform to operate there's a legacy there are processes and procedures always been in place and you know transformation is definitely on the top of, of, of the agenda but of course disruption can sometimes uh, be difficult to keep up uh, keep pace with so we've set this up really to allow ourselves to kind of disrupt um, you know and lean in and, and, and drive disruption ourselves and 
know, the, the idea of, of, of keeping it within the bank and not just kind of putting it somewhere else um, is really the, the, the strategic ambition to bring together, you know, what the fintechs and the, the startup really brings, the nimbleness, the curiosity, the new technology, the ability to start from scratch, uh, move quickly, short, you know, decision-making processes, and bring that together uh, with the strength of the, an incumbent bank. So having the balance sheet, access to capital markets, you know, a brand, a, a, a network, customers, data, all those things. So, you know, you put those two things on a PowerPoint slide, it looks brilliant to bring those two worlds together. Uh, you know, in reality, of course, there's multiple challenges with that. But the idea is really to kind of, you know, take the best out of those two worlds and, and, and build something from that. So um, right now we're, we're building both a platform, so a technology platform uh, from which we can then, you know, start building new products. And, and the first product is, is something we've got in the market right now, which is aiming for, for uh, self-employed. So that's the first product coming off the SBX platform. But the notion is really kind of build that technology and, and accel accelerate the, the ability to, do, to bring new products to market as well. So SBX is not a, I cannot as a consumer start using SBX yet, or? The, well, the, the, uh, the first product that we built is actually in beta right now. So uh, it's called Unquo, and it is aiming for self-employed. That product you know, at unquo.com, you're more than welcome to sign up if you have your own business. Yeah, uh, we're welcoming you I do. Business right now. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, here it is. Here, here, here's the name. Uh, okay. Here's the card. Here's the card that you're going to get with it. Uh, you know, a dual card, both for your private and your corporate purchase, the, the first in the world. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to pitch. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, so you get on with that first product is out. But the idea is really to kind of have, you know, to build a platform. So, you know, the platform that you find under Unquo is, is just totally, you know, over calibrated for what, you know, this product is right now. Because the, the ambition is really to be able to, to build a scalable, reusable, generic technology platform uh, from which we can then build products like Unquo. Uh, other products or, or even support the, the broader SCB over time. Okay, thanks a lot, guys. And uh, let's leave the promoting part of this panel's this discussion now. <laughs> so let's move on to the, to the questions. Uh, and I would like to start with, uh, this is like a really big one. You could actually, you could probably talk about this, the whole panel discussion. But if you look at the fast growing fintech industry, uh, and that of course is affecting traditional banks, which are the main implications of this? Uh, Anna, maybe you would like to start. Uh, yeah, uh, well, the, <laughs> that's a just, biggie. It's a very big question, as I said, but just to boil it down, uh, I mean, the, of course, competition uh, brings up a sense of urgency yeah. that, that has been increased and also a willingness to increase investment to, to meet this competition. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, traditional banks, if I look at them, yeah. they have so many... Because position in, in traditional banks as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they have so many other things to deal with as well. So this, right. this really is a challenge in itself. I mean, the, the split vision that you have, that you have to invest into regulatory, that you have to invest into... To, uh, yeah, or that you have to manage your income also short term, given that the interest rate environment is very low. Uh, but this uh, also gives an opportunity, of course, for fintechs to also come in and enable larger banks uh, to actually transform. So it's both, um, just like Donnelly, for example, is doing with Tink, uh, that they are a provider for, for large banks. So it's, it's both competition, direct competition, but also uh, an increased uh, opportunity, I would say, for fintechs to come in and enable large traditional banks uh, to transform um, also on, on their platform, so to speak. So everybody can gain from it, sort of? Yes, in the, in uh, depending end. on where you are in the value chain yeah. and, and your business model, yes. Yeah. The, definitely, traditional business models are being challenged. Yeah. So how do you feel about this? What, uh, Daniel, for example, what do you say about the implications for banks? So I would agree with what Anna says. So we see two mega trends in banking. One is banking going from analog, uh, meaning kind of offline to online and data driven. And it's going from closed to open. And I think that both of these trends have major implications for banks. Obviously, one of the, the key assets of a bank has been the distribution power historically, being able to sell all of these, everything from investments to mortgages to consumer loans and credit cards uh, at each local branch in each small you know, village of the world. And with digital banking, that, that of course brings uh, opportunities, cost savings, closer dialogues with customers, but also uh, 
you know, losing one of the, the main assets, uh, which, which then anyone else can, can compete with. And the same basically goes on the uh, closed to open. So the account opening bank have traditionally had a monopoly on accessing uh, the bank account. And that has been an extremely important asset, meaning you have almost a forced day-to-day -day relationship with the end client. They need to go in to make payments or to check the balances. Uh, and with open banking, that means that anyone can essentially access their um, traditional bank account from elsewhere. Um, so that's probably on the downside for the traditional banks. On the upside, obviously, is that they can, for the first time, start to build um, bank-independent um, banking software so that uh, a Nordea customer or ABN customer could, could access their accounts elsewhere and be more competitive versus Rabobank or versus Swedbank, et cetera. So I think it's, it's, as Anna said, this is, depending on where you are in the value chain, this is definitely both uh, threats and opportunities. Right. So San, what are, you, what are your sort of takeaways from this uh, when it comes to implications? To, to build on uh, Anna's and Daniel's uh, um, input, uh, I would say it's more collaboration than uh, competition uh, together with the banks uh, and, and the fintechs. Uh, uh, the banks, they started out uh, shying away from the, the fintechs in the beginning, uh, and then they realized uh, there, there's so much more to win uh, in the collaboration. The banks uh, have the uh, the fin uh, in the tech and they have uh, the customers and, and, and the trust uh, part of it and then uh, the tech uh, has the agility the technology and uh, the product and the new business uh, model so that's a good win-win uh, uh, situation the fintechs are getting stronger and stronger and stronger uh, just look at uh, tink and uh, um, paypal and uh, quite a lot of the other uh, companies uh, out there that brings me to the next one the, the whole world is the marketplace uh, and that is also included in the competitions so we can't sit here in the nordic saying that uh, we we have a we have a a market of 35 million people, uh, if you take the, the Nordic and the Baltic, including Iceland. Um, this is a tiny little uh, market and we can get the competition in. Uh, and then uh, uh, the digitalization is being speeded up, of course, uh, help with the pandemic uh, that <laughs> you're forced to, to become more uh, digital. Uh, and that is uh, pushing the banks uh, who's uh, sitting on legacy system, costing a fortune. Uh, versus uh, the fintechs, uh, they have a state-of-the-art uh, technology and uh, moving uh, faster. All right, thank you. And uh, Christophe, what, what do you say? You have like, you have one leg in both worlds, so to speak, like mm. in the traditional bank and in the sort of a startup in the bank. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I can echo the comments that, that we've heard thus far. I think what's clear in the market is that fintechs have proven the ability to operate at a completely different level of operating expenses. So I think if you look at an average European universal bank versus you know, a, one of the uh, more recent breed fintech um, players, you would say that the cost to operate the customer, I would say, is give or take a tenth of the cost mm -hmm. of an incumbent bank. So it's a factor of 10 times cheaper to operate, you know, completely cloud native, you know, with Microsoft, the, the way that you can build, you know, this wasn't possible. No bank that has more than, you know, 15, 20 years of history is anywhere else than kind of on servers, you know, on-premise, um, you know, mainframe technologies, you know, and nobody would dream of starting a bank like that today. Yeah. So, you know, that has just catapulted the, the, the possibilities to operate at a completely different level. Now, we have still to see, um, you know, in, in, in many areas, the ability to fully, you know, build revenue models that can actually uh, start shifting the big revenue pools from the incumbent banking system. So I think it's popular often to kind of polarize. And I, you know, I think that, you know, 11FS is kind of well-renowned uh, consultancy bureau in, in, in the UK that operates, talks a lot to the, to the fintech industry. It says that, you know, this is now you know, becoming a, a bit of a race between how fast fintech can, can gain revenues, distribution, and monetization versus how fast incumbents can innovate. Um, but I would pick up on what Susan said. I think you know, you, you're seeing increasingly these two worlds blending. And I think you know, SCBX is an effort to bring these two worlds together, but you know, we see it all over the place. And I think you know, when you can bring those two um, uh, you know, opportunity sets together, I think that's really where the, where the, where the, future, um, where the future lies. And I think you know, we're probably going to start to see new models emerging. And, and to Anna's point, you know, where are you in the value chain? 
And I think banks, I think, are increasingly open, and certainly we at SCB are increasingly open to re reevaluate the traditional notion that the bank is a kind of a vertically integrated, you build your own product, you distribute your own products, you captive customers with your own systems. That's totally opening up. And to Daniel's point, you know, we're moving to open. Yeah, so you realize that there are other players in the market that are going to do these things better than, than you are. You know, nobody would dream of building their own cloud. You know, there are excellent cloud providers. So that's what you build on. And you pick those best in breed opportunities, build them together, uh, and then decide where you want to play in the value chain. But I think, you know, I, I really think over the next three to five years, our industry is going to change dramatically. So it's a fascinating time right now to be in, to be in banking. So how do you, what, what do you, how do you actually, if, if I understand you correctly, your mission or your, your task uh, that you're doing now is sort of how would you start a new bank if you started from the beginning? Is that the way you do it in SEBX? So, so That's how, a brilliant way to describe it. Yeah. So how do you do that? What's the, like the, if you put down the first sort of five things on your to-do list, what is that? Yeah, so I think, what we decided early on was that we need to be very clear that this is not a technology uh, initiative and, you know, go through the kind of banking stack that we have today and say, okay, so how do we get a better order management system? Or how do we get a better core banking system? You know, we have to start, the, the first notion is that we have to start with a value proposition. There needs to be a customer at the end of whatever we're building. There needs to be demand and a clear you know, value proposition that we're developing. That's why it was so important at the very early stage to have a clear, you know, business opportunity to go after. And that's where we found the self-employed, a fast growing segment, you know, not just in Sweden, but in Europe and globally, uh, typically underserved and a bit difficult to serve for incumbent banks. And we saw that in our own data at SCB, we saw it across the marketplace. Um, and this was an interesting market opportunity to go after. So, you know, out of, out of you know, if, if we say that we have the purpose to explore technology and build new products, you know, building new products had to, be come, had to come first. So very clearly, you know, the value proposition of, you know, you know building new tech cannot be an alibi for a kind of half-baked product. We need to have a product and a value proposition that, you know, we would be willing to put our own money into. Um, you know, it has to be a real value opportunity. And then once we figure that one out, we said, okay, this is the one we want to go for. Then we start saying, okay, so we're going to be needing to onboarding customers here. We need to rethink the KYC process. We need a core banking system. But we're not starting with the core banking system. We're starting with the value proposition. So my, my clear um, uh, you know, learning, and again, we're very humble. We're early on. We're, we're you know, about two years into this project. And you know, we're seeing a lot of these initiatives elsewhere across Europe and other European banks as well. And I'm sure Daniel will have seen many of them you know, in his dialogues with European banks. Um, but, but our learning early on was that you know, we need to make it very customer driven. But when we start building the tech, that's where it becomes more generic, scalable, and recyclable. Okay, I have to try you on then, uh, see if uh, if it is that way that you sort of describe it. But uh, uh, absolutely, <laughs> keep me posted. <laughs> yeah. Susan, I'm a bit curious because uh, if I understand it correctly, you this morning uh, released a Nordic fintech report 2020. Uh, and it's based on interviews with a large uh, number of fintech companies. So please tell us, what are the main findings in that report? Here's the, the front page. Everything, of course, is digital, so this is uh, printed out uh, just now. Um, the findings uh, is that we are working together with uh, Fintechable, uh, and together we are making the, the Global Fintech Index. We have interviewed uh, more than 30 uh, fintechs and financial services uh, in in, uh, in uh, the Nordics and the Baltics, uh, so all the eight uh, countries, uh, including Iceland. And uh, what we see is that uh, the Nordic and the Baltic, they punch above their weight. Uh, and uh, we rank uh, um, also the countries and the cities uh, in, in the global uh, setting. So uh, uh, Lithuania, number four, uh, Sweden, uh, number uh, 10, I think, uh, Estonia, number uh, seven. And then on the city ranking, uh, Vilnius is uh, high and uh, Stockholm is also uh, very high on this one. This tells us that uh, there, there's a lot going on uh, with uh, above a thousand uh, fintechs that is in this uh, uh, region. And it's very much focusing on scaling and uh, on top line growth. The top line growth, I think, uh, has been pushed forward uh, with the pandemic uh, uh, because uh, the investors, uh, they like to see some uh, tractions and the real tractions uh, because they're a little bit more cautious now than they used to uh, before the pandemic uh, came in. 
it's very diverse and uh, innovative uh, marketplace. So it's a uh, quite a lot of uh, places, uh, payment, uh, lending, marketplaces, uh, and, and so forth uh, that is in there. Uh, we see that uh, the payments uh, providers, they are kind of evenly uh, spread among uh, Oslo, Stockholm, Copenhagen and uh, Helsinki. Uh, Vilnius is also coming up on that. The Baltic seems to have uh, uh, on the, the blockchain and Bitcoin type of thing, they have an edge on that, uh, that one. Uh, as mentioned, uh, digitalization has uh, speeded up, and in particular on the e-commerce uh, side. Look at all the, uh, the e-commerce uh, places uh, around that uh, has either been fully digital before uh, the pandemic or semi-digital, and they have moved over completely. So there's quite a steep uh, uh, thing there. Um, RegTech with open banking and AI, those are the two things. Uh, we're probably going to talk about <laughs> open banking later on, uh, but we, we are only coming to the first phase of the open banking. And there's a lot to be done there, but it has to uh, have value. It's more focused on the SME. This is an underserved market that needs to be treated uh, much better than the banks have done so far with their providing on lending and uh, capital. And then we see also that uh, sustainable finance uh, globally and the financial inclusion uh, focusing on emerging market. Quite a few of the Nordic uh, Baltic uh, fintechs, uh, they are based on the ground uh, in, uh, in uh, emerging market. Uh, Jamie won uh, down in uh, Ethiopia, uh, Crunchbase over in India. So quite a lot is uh, happening there. Okay. Thank you, thank you for those takeaways. Um, I'd like to, uh, to take it up on you, uh, Christopher. You were talking about, you were saying that like in the five, coming five and ten years, you're going to see a dramatical change when it comes to, to banking and I guess financial infrastructure as well. Uh, so let's talk about the future. Um, what do you say, Anna? If you look like five years ahead, uh, what's, yeah. what, what, what has happened? No, but if you, if you look back five, I mean, in one way, uh, I think uh, a lot will have happened. But I think if you stretch out the time frame even longer, uh, you know, you, you will see real disruption happening. Uh, but, but if I think five years, I think what we've seen is, if I look back, then pay, the payments industry have been disrupted to a larger extent than some of the other product areas or areas of banking. And looking ahead, I think credits is, is definitely coming and up. What, what do you mean by that, the payment? Um, if I look at the share of traditional banks' income yeah. uh, versus new entrants, new entrants, but but fintechs, you can see that a quite big share, I don't know if it's approximately 40% or so, is now taken by non-traditional banks within payments. All right. So that that part of, of the you know the, the product uh, floor has already been been disrupted. But if yeah. I look at other areas the larger banks still have the main share of the income and you can see quite small um, income growth from uh, new entrants but looking ahead I think for example on the credit side uh, that market will be disrupted in many ways I think both in terms of how it's distributed uh, more in platforms maybe in open banking settings for example uh, together with other products uh, peer to peer lending or uh, well, uh, I'd, yes, peer-to-peer -peer lending, but if you look at, there are new ways of funding yourself, yeah. both, uh, I mean, you have some of the new entrants in Sweden, for example, the Stabilo, for example, coming yeah. in with a new way of financing outside the traditional banking market. Yeah. Uh, and then with blockchain or, or rather distributed ledger technology, you will be able to, over time, issue bonds as well on the market without having a bank. So also the financing from, from the banking perspective, will, you can do that in other ways in the future. Uh, and then you look at from a customer perspective, I think you will buy credits in, in new ways, for example, mortgages or consumer finances will be bought, uh, maybe not through traditional banks. So it's being disrupted in both the infrastructure, but also the customer behavior will change. So that's just one area to pick many, many areas <laughs> that, will, that will change. Yeah. But if I look near term, i.e. five years, I think that's an area that is up for some change. All right, all right, thank you. Uh, Daniel, what do, what do you say? You, you, you're part of shaping the future. Well, every, everyone is mm -hmm. in a way, but I mean, I think you're sort of one of the headlines of, of shaping the, the next. Well, I think that we're only going to see more about those two megaways that we tried to trailblaze, making uh, banking data-driven, 
meaning everything from decision making to upselling to how you interact with your customers. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the open banking movement may be slightly slow, 17, 18, 19. I think this year was, was uh, just through the roof. I mean, we see extreme volume growth, both in payments uh, and in, in aggregation with different products on top. And, and I think that that is set to continue. We also see that while a lot of our customers started with one use case like customer onboarding or credit scoring, they also see this opportunity to do, well, can we do merchant KYC? Can we do uh, uh, you know, multi, multi-banking payment initiation? There's, there's so many ways to, to use this online technology. So I think it's going to be an integrated part of, of every financial service um, of the future. All right. Uh, Christopher, now you, uh, you got your chance. What, what do you think? I think there's no pitching. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> no promotion. <laughs> okay, I have to rethink my answer. Now, I think I think I really think there is there is you know two phases to this because what what we're seeing now um, in a lot of these um, you know the, the the disruptive phase is is more of a you know the the, the product the, the product of banking. I mean, money has been digital for a long time, so the product in and of itself hasn't really been disrupted. In many cases, we've seen just brilliant uh, new entrants coming in and sh- reshaping the way it's being distributed, reshaping customer experiences, reshaping you know packaging and and, and delivery and 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 and, and uh, UX. So, I think that you know the, the product is yet to be to be disrupted. And I think you know what Anna is onto there, where there are uh, you know areas where we're actually going to see real disruption. You know, at the end of every financial transaction today sits a balance sheet of a bank. Um, and, you know, that may probably be the same thing for a while. I mean, if I look at, you know, the, the, the fascinating to follow the, the, the big techs entry into financial services, and, of course, we've seen them for a long time watching the space. Uh, but, you know, when Apple launches, it's a Goldman Sachs balance sheet and a MasterCard, uh, you know, network. When Google launches, it's a Citigroup bank account. So I'm sure when they sat, you know, a group of in- clever engineers in a room and said, let's disrupt those bankers, I'm sure they didn't come up with a, you know, corporation idea with a bank. So, you know, there is, co- there is disruption coming and it's going to look something different. And then, that, then I think at that point, you know, the, the traditional model of, of, you know, a balance sheet being at the core of everything that happens, that has to be disrupted. And then, you know, the product in and of itself is really being disrupted. But I think, you know, that might be a little bit further out. So I think what we're going to see now is a phase where, you know, that distribution transformation that's happening right now will just continue to accelerate. Uh, but as long as we have that banking you know, requirement, and I think the famous Bill Gates quote, you know, banking uh, is necessary, banks are not, you know, that may be true for a while, you know, at some time banking might not be needed either. Um, but, but as long as it is, I think that's where it's so fascinating to see how banks then can really think about where they want to be, be positioned in the, uh, in the value chain and thinking about, you know, if there is indeed a balance sheet somewhere, you know, what does that mean for how we then distribute our products, which partners do we team up with, you know, banking as a service we're seeing just, you know, over the last 18 months, it's just accelerated as a trend and we've seen exponential uh, developments and, and, and money being poured into to startups in, in, in banking as a service, you know, we're getting a lot of companies approaching us saying that, oh, great, if you're building a bank that really wants to connect with the outside world, that'd be fantastic. Because, of course, everything that's been built on top of banking systems thus far, you know, account to account idea, you know, uh, products or all the products that have been built on top, even when, Don, you know, when you started building Tink, no bank openly said, hey, come and reverse engineer our APIs. That'll be great. And then you can build a business. You know, no bank has been designed to connect to the outside world. So if we build a bank that really <laughs> does connect to the outside world, that I think is really uh, the opportunity set for, for banks. And that's going to be, I think, you know, the direction of travel for the next three to five years. And that's going to completely change the way we see financial services being distributed. The next phase is then, you know, what is a banking product? five to ten years down the line and then i think you know we really need to think about what what, what when the product in and, of, in and of itself gets disrupted okay thanks a lot christopher we're uh, we're running over a bit over time here for the panel but i'm going to give the last word to susan in this issue uh so what is your sort of uh if you try, try to make it make it a bit short what's your view on the coming five years 
Uh, I would focus a little bit on the, what the, the challenges are. Funding is uh, still a big uh, challenge uh, for fintech in the Nordic and the, the Baltic. Um, uh, scale, uh, Sweden is doing uh, fabulously, but uh, the rest of the Nordic and the Baltic uh, need to ramp up and the collaboration is, is a key thing. Uh, getting banks fully on board on the bank, open banking infrastructure, that's, uh, that's still a key uh, question. And cross-border payment, real-time payment, a lot's going to happen uh, there. SMEs are underserved and uh, on financial service, so a lot's going to happen there. Either the bank uh, get their act to, together or uh, fintechs is uh, doing that uh, job. Financial inclusion to emerging markets and the Nordic uh, fintechs, they are on the ground, as I mentioned. And then we see uh, diversity within financial services. We are looking at and on this on a global uh, scale and uh, we were launched in uh, May at the World Economic uh, Forum. Thank you. Okay. Well, maybe just uh, a, a very short note on cooperation. I think it's All kind right. of funny because um, both, um, both Christopher and Anna actually had a significant part of the formation of TIC. So, so Christopher put his his, his money at think when as an investor when when you were at the the, the traditional SEB became our first customer in Sweden Anna then I probably was uh, you were heading retail banking in Sweden when you when Nordea became uh, think's fourth or fifth customer and and I think that without that kind of cooperation that we all talked about before we wouldn't be here so thank you both but it was right. not me I was conflicted <laughs> thank you know you. that <laughs> for family reasons <laughs> okay yes. right so it's, Just it's for the record it's yeah. uh, it's a, it's one big ecosystem it is I thank you all. We can uh, continue to talk about this the whole night. It's an interesting area, but we have to to stop. Uh, but I have a small surprise for you. So stay put online and Anna, stay put in the studio and uh, over to Anders. Okay, uh, we had a long day, a great day with uh, top-notch uh, people uh, since uh, nine o'clock this morning. So um, besides all these experienced uh, uh, fintech entrepreneurs, investor, board professionals, we have a great bundle of new fintechs in Sweden. So we cannot bring them here. Uh, we are eight already, so that's, we cannot be more than that. Um, so just to highlight one company, one female entrepreneur. We have a female founders event ongoing right now in the same building. So uh, an issue we are actively working with, I think we have about 5% of the fintech entrepreneurs in Sweden are female. It's way too low. So this is one brave woman, uh, and now she's going to present what she's doing and why. And I would like you to listen. Thank you, Anders. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jasguli Ismailova. I'm a co-founder uh, and CEO of Sparla. And I will start with a confession. Um, a year ago, I worked in a bank. I had a high salary, but however, I would find myself feeling broke every month. And the reason was that every month I would transfer part of my salary to my savings account to create this artificial scarcity a feeling of that it's a limited, I, I cannot overspend. It was a way for me to avoid overspending. Still, at the end of the month, I would end up transferring that money back. But how about those who don't have a safety net? I realized that my problem should be also a problem of millions of other people. I, on, my help, on my way to search for a help, I was looking for uh, some apps, uh, budgeting apps, but uh, I would end up juggling uh, between different analytical tools without being able to solve my problem. A research shows that almost half of Swedish population find it difficult to make money last because of uh, bad planning habits, because of uh, loans, and because of changed life situations. And it's not surprising. It has never been so smooth to buy and pay or forget to pay later. The current business models are designed to make us overspend. Credit card companies give you points for spending more. And that, in combination with low financial skills, low in interest in personal finance, 
is leaving millions of people out of the savings market. And we are consuming as if we had four planets instead of one. Buy three, pay for two, even though you need only one. But what if instead we would incentivize people to spend less we would celebrate them making more sustainable choices. And that's what Isparla is on a mission for, to achieve. Our team, uh, Stanislav, Carolina and I, are on a mission to raise awareness, to liberate people, to become more aware of their personal finances, to break this course of overconsumption. And powered by open banking and nudging, ESG categorization that we are developing um, in-house. We want to create a new way of managing money, a financial fitness app called Sparla. We will apply transparent and straightforward subscription model with free and premium options. And um, in that way, we want to uh, help people to build financial health without them being on a diet every month. So. What is it next then? So we have just launched our MVP, um, a Sparla school, which is available both on App Store and Google Play. And uh, building our uh, budgeting function together with Stink. Uh, and um, yeah, stay tuned. And thank you for your attention and support. So uh, we don't have that much time. So just your so spontaneous um, uh, feedback or comment. Uh, Daniel, uh, you mentioned Tink. I don't know how much you know about Sparla or, or, or uh, just, just spontaneous feedback. What do you think? I mean, I'm obviously a big fan of the subject. Uh, I've been trying to do it myself for a few years, uh, back 2012 through 2016, and failed. Uh, so I both know that there is a large need for that kind of product, and I know that it's damn hard to, to build it. But uh, the, the best of luck, and very happy to hear that you're using uh, our platform. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher, from the SBX perspective and your experience, of course. No, I think it's, it's, it's brilliant. I think there is, you know, when it comes to using data and, you know, providing um, real, valuable, actionable insights, I think we're just scraping the surface of the opportunities. I'm really glad to see that, you know, you're you're diving, diver, diving deeper into this space because I think, you know, I, I'm a huge user of every new uh, fintech service or every new um, financials app that I can get my hands on. And I frankly, I mean, they're getting, there's, there's a huge difference from what we've been used to, but I think there's still vast opportunities. So, so I think, uh, you know, great direction uh, that you're on to. So good luck and, and, and well done. Thank you so much. So how many apps do you really have in your mobile? I mean, you, if you try them all, is it... You know what? I'm, I think I'm actually a customer of more than 25 different wow. financial institutions, <laughs> if you call the financial institutions. No SAB, of course, right? SAB could maybe one of them, yeah, okay. but I wouldn't reveal you to banking, banking secrecy. Yeah, no. uh, Susanne, you've seen a lot. Yeah, uh, fantastic. I love the story and uh, go get them. And uh, I'm still uh, puzzled by the, the market that uh, we think we are literate or financially literate uh, to it and that and we have full control over so and so forth. Um, there's some work to be done uh, here. So, so keep on the, what you're doing and I love to help out the, in any way. Thank you so much. We come to that soon. Uh, Anna? <laughs> Yes, um, I don't know where to look. <laughs> if if um, no, but if you start with the need, I love that you start with the, the real need. Uh, and as Sam mentioned, financial literacy is a big problem, especially among young people. Uh, but the challenge is to get the engagement to work over time. And I think that's what Daniel referred to. How do you how do you keep your customers engaged and willing to actually spend time on something that many people think is not needing, needed, i.e., banks or banking. <laughs> That's a very good question, and that's a million-dollar question that we're also working on right now. We have uh, really good cases from uh, consumer market. For example, there is a brand called uh, Hey Street that have yeah. achieved this network effects and uh, went viral. So we are looking into actually being um, unconveniently true and uh, inviting people to open up mm. to speak about this because it is a problem and it is harmful that people overspend but they don't know what's the solution. 
And we're also partnering up with uh, brands such as Karma, um, Hack Your Closet, and other sustainable brands so that they can exchange their points for uh, more sustainable options. So these partnerships together with uh, really be being consumer-centric and building these communities and uh, like working on this uh, network effects is our big bet. Best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> Then we have a surprise. Or I know you hate surprises. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we were working on to, uh, to um, initiate uh, the Swedish FinTech Awards. Uh, still in working process, but uh, why not take that opportunity to launch that with one prize here and now uh, for your school? Um, in the category uh, I came up with yesterday, it's going to be called the Community Hero, uh, the Community yeah. Star. Uh, Jasko has been involved in many events, uh, Stockholm Fintech Week, right? Yes. An awesome event. It's coming in February, don't miss that. Uh, you uh, reached out, uh, do you need any help for this day? Yes, you were very early, ready to, to do some actual hands-on work if needed. So, and you've been a part of a lot of our events. So I think that is, is so good, and you're always so uh, positive and optimistic. Uh, I just love that. Um, so that's a prize we're going to create for your school the first time, the first prize ever. Um, Ulf, you do all the lunches, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to do... This is up to you now, Daniel and Christopher and Susanne. may be difficult, but um, uh, you're going to take your school for lunch, and then you're going to... Let's say moderate, talk about her mm -hmm. business, her future, what to do mm. and not to do. Mm. Because you have the experience mm. very few people have. Very, very few. You're top notch. Uh, uh, so. Of course. Would, would love to. And Thank I assume, so Christopher, with all this free advertising, he's paying. So, so really looking forward <laughs> to. Uh, to then I will do that. Uh, I'll connect Yaskul with you all. And then you find a time for lunch when time. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be terrific. So, so uh, let's, let's do that. Looking forward to that. Yes. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Should we should we give should we do a round of applause here for the for the new prize taker? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, and I'm so grateful for, for you, Anders, that yeah, yeah. Uh, you are supporting us for, for all of us. I appreciate. I mean, the support. I mean, uh, you can give a diploma. You can give some <laughs> uh, bonus check. I don't know, but uh, this is much more value. Yeah. Much, much more I value. I really appreciate it. Thank just you so much. for an entrepreneur to meet you and this talk open. That's awesome. By that, I think we're ready. I'm so happy you are online, Daniel, Christopher and Susanne. Uh, pleasure. Anna coming to the studio. Uh, 